Hi, everybody. My name is Uma Misha Newberry. I am the Interim Executive Director of Women's March Global. And today we are really excited to launch our second action to end violence against women. As you all know, in our anniversary um, March for this year, our focus was end violence against women globally because the rates of what women are experiencing are staggering. Last month, we were um, honored to work with Jasmine Kaur um, to really share the stories of the violence that women have experienced. We hope that you learned a lot as much as we did through that action. And this month, we are, we are um, incredibly honored to work with our strategic partner, Quality Now, um, and really learn from them about the law and sexual violence. Um, today, uh, we want you to ask questions of us. So please feel free to ask us questions on our Facebook Live chat. Um, we'll also be adding links in the Facebook Live so that you can follow Equality Now and learn about the work that they are doing. But please feel free to ask myself or Jackie questions. This is what we're going to be going over today um, in regards to this mini course. And we're calling this series um, for this month of, of action a mini course on um, the law and sexual violence. Um, so Jack is going to take us through um, what uh, the laws around sexual violence are, why this is so incredibly important, and what the scale of the problem is. Um, so I want to introduce today um, Jackie Hunt. She is the Director of Europe and Eurasia for Equality Now. Jackie, thank you so much for taking the time to um, share with us today and also share your expertise on, uh, on this topic area. Do you want to just introduce yourself and also the work that Equality Now does? Yes, thank you, Uma. It's so great to be partnering with you again. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm Jackie Hunt. I'm the Europe and Eurasia Director of Equality Now. We focus on protecting and promoting the rights of women and girls around the world, particularly using the law. We have a special focus on legal equality, sexual violence, harmful practices, and sex trafficking. Great. Thank you so much, Jackie. So, I want to go through in terms of what this mini course, what we aim to achieve with this mini course. Um, with this mini course, this is our second action to end violence against women. So every single month since the month of January, we will be focusing on actions that particularly address issue areas within this broad um, umbrella called violence against women and globally what the issues are and how we can work to really changing the narrative changing some of the landscape on these issues. So this particularly is a month long course, a mini course on sexual violence laws worldwide. And we are partnered with Equality Now because the work that they do from a legal perspective is incredible in terms of mapping out what the actual laws are and the barriers to justice that many women experience um, in this landscape. We hope to educate and raise awareness of the efforts to reform sexual violence laws globally and also highlight the incredible distances that we all, not just women, we all need to travel. Um, these talks will be hosted every single Wednesday with a member of the Equality Now team and, um, and their experts, so please do join us. So from there, Jackie, I wanna turn this over to you um, mm -hmm. so that you can talk about sexual violence laws and, and what the actual scale of the problem is. Well, the scale of a problem is huge. We will all know somebody who's likely to have either survived or known someone who survived sexual violence. So the World Health Organization puts this at one in three women worldwide who have experienced either physical and or sexual intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence. And 20 million worldwide girls that's one in 10 girls around the world, that's incredible, horrific figure, have experienced what UNICEF calls uh, forced intercourse or other forced sexual acts. I, um, I might term them differently, <laughs> but at some points in their lives. So they've been um, raped or sexually abused at some points in their lives. That's a terrible, terrible statistic. I think, you know, what, what a lot of people don't recognize, and you brought this up, you just said that we most likely know someone that has experienced sexual violence. Yet when we look at this issue, particularly from a global landscape, I think what we fail to recognize is that the experiences of what women face, for example, in Jamaica 
are very similar when it comes to sexual violence of the, of the experiences of what women and girls face in India. Um, yet we see these as isolated issues and not connected. Can you speak to why, you know, that, that, um, that viewpoint exists? I think what we need to be doing is focusing on perpetrators. I think we, when we look at individual system, we look at one story of one woman, or we, or we get figures like I've just given you, and they don't really mean anything to us because we don't see, if you put you know, one in 10 people in the world and, a, and a, all together, you would see the enormity of the challenge. What we're doing is we focus on one story, one story. And I also think that we quite often shut down because the stories are so painful and so difficult. And the way, and what I'm gonna come on to talk about too, is some of the way the laws are phrased and the way the justice system works in not really being able to give justice to women and girls and to actually almost blame them and re-victimize them through the system. So they might even be reluctant to come forward, reluctant to talk about their stories, reluctant to pursue justice. At the same time as those who are in law enforcement are trying to not really take sexual justice, uh, sexual violence seriously, not prosecute it, consider it still a private matter. So I think we've got a long way to go, but I think the laws, why we look at the laws is because of the way they frame sexual violence. And they're talking quite often about the woman and morality and what is done to her, as opposed to saying, this is a crime of violence and it needs to be prosecuted as a crime of violence and taken seriously. And I think we've got a long way to go to, to um, make sure that happens. Absolutely. And I think a perfect example of this is the case that was in Ireland in November of last year, the young girl that was um, that was raped. And I think it was the defense that held up her underwear as a sign of consent. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it, it, cases like that are such a stark reminder of the embedded um, misogyny and patriarchy of the system of, of the law. So um, as you said, we need to talk about why the law is so incredibly important in ending sexual violence. So if you could take us through some of these points, that would be great. Well, I think one of the, uh, one of the issues around why the law is important is first, it sends a signal of what we, our value system as a society. So we say in our society, we think sexual violence should not happen and it should be punished if it does happen. That should be the basis. If you don't have a law against sexual violence, and I understand there, aren't, there are countries that still don't even have proper laws, then you, you're not telling anyone what your value system is. You've not told anyone it's wrong and it, you can't prosecute it. And that comes on to the second point. If, if, if sexual violence is a crime, you can prosecute it. And if it's not prosecuted, you have a, a, a way of redress because you know that it's illegal in the law and you can bring some action to help you get justice. So that's why laws are important. The laws are also important. We, we uh, conducted a survey with the International Bar Association and other lawyers a couple of years ago and identified several trends in the way the laws are framed around the world. And this is all countries of the world. We hear you know, stories terrible stories from, from some countries that are in the media, but actually in all our countries, this is a problem. The way the law is framed, the way the law is not implemented, the way people regard sexual violence is really problematic. But there are some laws that are even very explicit in the way they let the perpetrator off the hook. So for example, there are some laws that say, um, you can make a settlement um, with, if, you, if you're a rapist, you can make a settlement with your victim and that will let you off the hook. And that settlement might mean if you marry her, you will not be charged with rape. That means though, she's subjected to a life with her rapist being raped over and over again without a choice. Her whole future um, is destroyed and he doesn't get punished. And the signal this law sends is women can be traded. It's their honor that's important. It's not what he did. It's somehow you've got to retain the purity of the woman and you retain it by allowing her to be married because in marriage then there's no such thing quite often as rape in the law. Um, so marriage covers a whole host of 
sins, if you like, and allows her to regain her honorable place in society, even though it's him who committed the crime and the violence. So those crimes, again, uh, those, those, um, the way that is framed in the law allows him to escape impunity and sends all these other messages. There are also laws framed in terms of morality. So again, it's about um, ha the, the law not talking about um, attacking her bodily integrity, it's about attacking her sense of honor or morality, which again makes her the receptacle of honor in her society. And we see also this has a knock-on effect to other laws. In some countries, if a woman is shown or even not fully shown to have breached the sexual mores of our country, a family member or others are allowed to kill her in so-called honor killings um, to um, purify, if you like, the honor of their family. Whereas again, it's her who's been raped. It's, it's, it's her who's been abused. And yet again, she's the vessel for the, for the honor of the family. We've seen laws that explicitly permit rape in marriage carries on exactly the same theme. Once you're married, you're a possession of your husband, you have no choice about whether you want sex or not. And even where they allow children to be married, they allow the rape then of those children in marriage. Um, again, we see laws allowing for judicial discretion to reduce charges. Um, and that allows the stereotypes in the system again to come to the fore. So everything we've been talking about till now about the victim's honor. So for example, in Iran, the judges allow discretion to really sort of make up evidence if, if you like. So if a woman claims she's been raped and she's been out and um, she's been out without family members, for example, she's been out by herself or in the company of a man, the judge will be entitled to say, well, you were out, with, in the company of a man, what were, you, what were you doing out in the company of a man? You must be a loose woman. If you're a loose woman, um, maybe, you know, you're maybe an adulteress or something like that, rather than the fact that something has happened to you. So that again, her so-called morality or the way she chooses to behave, or even if she doesn't, even if she's in the company of someone, he's allowed to um, believe what he likes about what her behavior is and so judge her accordingly. There are other laws that fail to recognize that true consent is impossible in situations of dependency or of extreme vulnerability. So for example, if you are um, in a family situation or if you're in a care situation or if you have um, mental health issues and you're not, you can be maybe, um, Mis misled, exploited really, exploited by someone who's in a position of power over you. And so the whole issue of consent becomes moot because you're not in a position to really be able to consent because, or, you know, maybe it's grades in, for school and those kind of issues. When schoolgirls in Africa, we have a lot of um, cases, not just there, um, where girls have been forced into um, exchanging sex for grades. I would call that rape as well. Um, and that kind, of, and 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 the teachers then say, well, you know, she asked for it, but she was okay with it. And you think, well, no, not really. You're really, really exploiting that situation, and making it difficult. Because if she can't get through school, what is her future, and, and how? What is her situation? Um, there are laws and practices inhibiting investigation or prosecution. Laws, for example, which says a woman has to bring the case herself. In many countries, you go and report to the police, the police investigate, um, and then you bring charges if that's appropriate. In many countries, uh, you, as it seemed you have to do that as a private citizen. Uh, so you would go and then you'd collect the evidence yourself and you'd bring it. So that becomes very difficult for you. You don't know the law. You're discouraged by law enforcement from bringing those cases. You don't have the resources to be able to do that. You're probably uh, traumatized. You might be intimidated by the family or the perpetrator to drop the case. So it makes it very, very difficult for you to pursue that prosecution. Um, then there are others requiring witness corroboration or other burdensome evidence. So there are some where you need um, medical, absolutely need medical evidence in order to prove it. So what if you're in a rural community somewhere 
there's no doctor nearby, you're in a situation where it's, you know, you're going to be accused of being the wrongdoer anyway, and suddenly you've got to find even possibly a government accredited doctor to take that evidence so that you can think about a pursuing case. Think about having to think through all that, access all that, even if you're, um, and you have few resources trying to do all that, That's, that makes it impossible really to pursue the case. So um, that's, that's, and if the law says, well, you can't pursue a case unless you have medical evidence, and sometimes unless you have certified medical evidence, that is difficult, or unless you have witnesses. I mean, how many, uh, how many rape crimes would have witnesses? And you'd think, well, if they are witnessing it, <laughs> wouldn't you prosecute them as well? So there's very, you know, there's obstacles all the way along the line in the law, embedded in the law, forget about the whole environment that we all live in, um, in the law itself, which uh, really makes access to justice for sexual violence around the world a very difficult thing to obtain. I think, I mean, it's incredible um, from, from my perspective, looking at all of um, some of these common problems that, that you have listed here. Um, and what strikes me is that, you know, you, you talk about the fact that these are lack of, you know, there, there's a um, complete lack of access to justice for, for women, but if you are um, an individual that is incredibly marginalized or, you know, faces even further oppression for being yeah. indigenous, for, you know, um, coming from a, a low socioeconomic background, you experience even more barriers um, than the ones even just listed here of even getting, for example, to the police station and getting this case in front of you know, a judge or, a, you know, a jury to even be heard. Um, it's, it's incredible that, you know, that what, what we're looking at here. Um, yeah, you've I made an excellent point. Yeah, excellent, excellent point. I think there are so many, um, so many forms of discrimination. And if you are, um, as you say, if you're from an ethnic minority community, if you're um, maybe a person with disabilities, who's even, um, we had a case in Uganda where a girl was raped and she was deaf, blind and mute. And how was she, and the police didn't even know where to start getting evidence. I mean, in a, in a sense, they didn't, they didn't even try. Um, we helped in the end at least to pay for a DNA test, which was, you know, push the, and push the prosecution. And then you get, you know, marginalized communities who, who don't like engaging with law enforcement, who are again prejudice. Um, and over and over again, these layers of discrimination against people make it more and more difficult for women from those communities to be able to access justice. I think this is why, um, you know, the knowledge like this in this mini course is so incredibly um, important because so many people are unaware of the fact that you, there are these common, very common problems with the laws themselves that we are completely unaware of until we um, are faced with a situation where we can't um, have justice for whatever reason. So yeah. I think from a, from a starting point, this is, you know, this is incredibly helpful, um, you know, to, to many people, including myself. I'm trying to click over to the to the next slide, but I would love for you to discuss in terms of um, the key takeaways from this. Uh, when we're talking about the law on sexual violence, I know that Equality Now has done a lot of work in putting together um, a report um, on on rape laws. If you could talk about that and and the need also for this report and the importance of it, that would be great. Yes, we put out the report a couple of years ago, as I said, with these themes. Um, what we've done is we've mobilized our international membership. We have membership around the world. We know these issues affect women around the world. Mm -hmm. And we've asked everyone to sign a petition that we've delivered to governments. Every time, what we, what we do is we use legal mechanisms. So we use government's own obligations. They sign up to international conventions where they pledge to protect and promote the rights of women, to not discriminate, to not uh, um, to stop violence. Um, we petition the committees that are overseeing those conventions all the time. And the other thing we do is sometimes take strategic litigation. So when we have cases like these, Mm -hmm. um, and we have quite a lot of these cases, we try and push them through the legal system, either through a national legal system or regional or international, to develop some 
judgments that are going to be helpful in order to leverage for change in the law. So what we're pushing for is a range of, of things. One is a change in the law. And for that, we have broad discussions with groups from all over the world because a, a lot of the trends, as I say, are very similar, but still not one size fits all. And we need to also look at how the law is in each country. And coming back to what we've just discussed about women with disabilities, women from minority communities, and so many others who are discriminated against, they are often be, uh, they are often left out of these conversations. And we need to make sure that everybody is brought in so that the law works for everybody and the systems work for everybody. We know that by changing the law and by getting our members to petition for change, petitioning ourselves for change, engaging with governments for change, even then that's not enough because those who implement the law are often still holding these stereotypes and still practicing their own, um, living out their own stereotypes, if you like, so that when women come to them, they won't treat them in the right way. They won't um, think about um, how they can help them get justice. They'll even put them off trying to bring cases. Even in the UK now, we're talking, you mentioned the case in Ireland, there's, uh, a lot of delving into women's sexual history and you think why are they doing that we're talking about one one incident here and that and the incident around that why are they looking you know through years and years in the past again they're going to they're trying to construct an image of whether a woman's a good victim a bad victim whether she's sexually promiscuous or not whether that makes her more or less likely um, to, to have been raped, rather than looking at the evidence on the case and whether violence happened in that particular case. So there's a lot of prejudice around the procedures as well, which is very difficult. Mm -hmm. The other thing, of course, we look at is in each part of the system, uh, we need more diversity in making the laws in the first place. So who are the MPs? I think the Interparliamentary Unions come out with a report today about how many women MPs there are around the world. It's getting better, but it's still on average uh, way under 30%, I think. So who are make, who's making those laws? Um, who's coming with those prejudices? And we all have those prejudices. I'm not saying we don't, but certainly at least women know their lived experiences so they can bring them to bear in those laws. Well, who are the judges in these situations? Most, most judges are male. And of course, also come from one part of society, as we were talking about intersectionality before. Who runs the media even? Who perpetuates these stereotypes? There's a lot of media stories about how the woman asked for it. There was a story in a British newspaper, the Daily Mail a few years ago, um, about two 13-year-old girls who'd been gang raped in a park. And the headline was, orgy in the park. Orgy, I mean, that's participatory sex that's no that's nothing to do with being raped and it was the whole tenor of the story was about how the girls were guilty and their parents were guilty for letting the girls be promiscuous one girl apparently only wanted to be raped once because she wasn't willing i mean the whole way the story was written was ridiculous and the and the men the, the who had raped her they did go to prison but they were portrayed as they were between i think 17 and 21 23 and they weren't called rapists. They were, they were promising young footballers who sacrificed their careers. So you can see even in the media, we are, these messages are reinforced to us over and over again. So when you get into a court and you, and you have a judge or a jury that's passing these sentences, they are also influenced by the environment that we live in and by the general um, discrimination and sexism in our society. So while Equality Now is looking very much at the law and legal processes, the implementation of the law, we also can't fail to highlight these other issues that are going to have an impact on access to justice for all of us. Absolutely. I mean, as you said earlier, there are many layers to oppression, you know, and, and in this in this avenue to, to justice with, with laws, but there are also many layers of patriarchy that have been formed the, the structure that we exist in and, and live in, um, you know, and, and for, for us, a lot of the work is changing that narrative. So putting the onus on men. So, you know, changing the headline. So, it, it, you know, the onus there in that, in that horrendous case, you know, is squarely on the men and not on the girls, which is horrific. Yeah. Uh, 
I want to, uh, Jackie, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to, um, you know, really educate all of us on what are some of the most common issues that you see from your perspective in, um, in the lack of access to justice with the legal system. Thank you so much for your expertise on this. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Yes. Um, for everyone else, um, if you have questions for Jackie, you had her contact information on, on the previous slide, please get in touch with her. We can also send her a message. Um, every single week, as I said at the beginning of this webinar, we are uh, working with Equality Now to really provide um, you know, these spaces where you can learn about what rape consent laws look like around the world. Next week, we're actually going to be talking about the rape, uh, the rape law report um, that Equality Now put together. We're also looking the week after that at sexual violence laws in the MENA region. Then after that, we're taking a closer look at Bolivia and then, um, and then Eurasia and Africa um, for our last week. So please uh, stay with us every single Wednesday. We'll send you reminder emails. There's a link um, in, the, um, in the Facebook live chat for the sign up um, link for the course. Um, thank you so much for everyone who has joined us. And thank you so much again, Jackie, for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.